So let's continue. We are, we're still talking about uh, standard ML. And uh, now we want to talk about binding names to values. So <clears throat> we have seen earlier how, how we do this. We basically use the val keyword, then the name and an expression. So we're binding the value of the expression to this name. But notice, and this is very important, this is not the same as assigning a value to a variable in an imperative language or an object-oriented language. So why not? So let's take an example here. Let me open the interpreter. And if I do val x is equal to 2, I, I have bound the, val the integer value 2 to the name x. Now let me define a function called add x, which takes a single argument y, and what does it return? x plus y. What does the uh, interpreter tell me? Well, it's a function that maps an integer to, to an integer. Now I call this function with the actual parameter 3. What do I get back? Well, the actual parameter 3 is substituted for the formal parameter. Uh, so, sorry, the formal parameter y is substituted with the actual parameter 3. So here it says x plus 3. But what is x? Well, we defined it earlier. x, we bound the value 2 to the, the variable of the name x. So we get 2 plus 3, which is 5. No big surprise. Now, let us introduce or overwrite or change, basically. Change the value definition here. So we're saying x has the value 5 now. So it looks like we are, in a way, you might think that this x, which is not local to the function at x, it a, behaves a kind of like a global variable and that we had already given the global variable x the value 2. This would really be the case in an, in an imperative language. Now um, let's assume that we think this is the way and we are changing the global variable x and giving it the value 5 and now we call add x again with the actual parameter 3 and what should we get back then? x plus 3 and x has been changed to 5. We should get back 8. Wrong, actually. We get back 5. So why is this? Well, we said that the names in ML, and this generally holds for functional program languages, do not behave like variables in an imperative language. Uh, so when I bound the value 2 to the name x, x really behaves like a constant. So when we define the function add x as being taking one single ar argument y and returning x plus y, we, uh, ML substitutes uh, the, the name x out for its value, which is the value 2. So we get 2 plus 3. Then, no matter what we do with this x later, it doesn't have any effect. So it doesn't have any side effects. The x inside the in the x in the body of the function add x is not a variable in the same sense as in an imperative language. It's a constant. So changing or introducing a new uh, association in the, in, the, in the environment, a new x is equal to 5 here. It's a different x, really. It's, n it's not the one that is used inside the function, because inside the function it's, it's a constant. It's the constant 2. So this doesn't change at all the value of the function x. And this is consistent with uh, our discussion on functional programming languages uh, not having side effects. 
because even though I changed or introduced uh, or bound the, the value 5 to x and then ran the function again, it didn't change the value of the function. So it it doesn't matter, notice this, it doesn't matter when I call the function, it always gives me the same value. It's referentially transparent, as we say. Gives me the same value no matter when I call it. Now, uh, we saw let statements in Scheme, and we also have let statements available in uh, SML. So we can say let val and then some name uh, be equal to. Uh, an expression in some other expression. What do we mean by this? For example, we can say let val p uh, or pi is equal to 3.14159 in pi times radius times radius. So how does uh, uh, ML calc uh, calculate the value of this expression? Well, when it sees pi times radius times radius, it um, substitutes pi with the value of pi introduced in the let expression. So here pi is really behaves like a constant. So here of course radius has to be defined uh, as well in order for this expression to be able to calculate or gi give a result. And this is very similar behavior as we saw in, in Scheme. Here's another example, the function 100th power. Uh, we take an x as an argument, and here notice, here we explicitly specify the type of the, the formal parameter. And so this is definitely possible, even though it's more common to, to, use, uh, to uh, use the type inference functionality of the language. Here we explicitly tell the compiler that, or the interpreter, that it's a uh, the formal parameter is a real. And what do we do here? We have a let statement that says uh, the name 4 is bound to the value x times x times x times x, so x to the power of 4. The name 20 is bound to the value 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4. So and what is the what is the thing that we want to calculate? We want to calculate 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 times 20. So basically 20 to the power of 5. And so the way uh, ML calculates this is it first calculates the value of the right-hand side expression uh, x to the power of 4 and gives and bound, bind, binds the name 4 to that value. Then it calculates uh, the right hand expression for the next val statement. Uh, so 20 becomes uh, 4 to the power of 5. And notice that 4 has already been given a value in the previous statement. And then it uses these two, or basically the, the value 20, in this statement 20 to the power of 5. Now, uh, so the last thing that we want to do, and this will this will take some time actually, is to write uh, a, a sorting uh, program. We want to write merge sort, and we want to we're going to write that in this language, SML, and we're going to break it up to individual uh, some individual functions, and the first function that we're going to look at is the function merge. Uh, the function merge takes uh, two uh, arguments. It actually takes, well, we can say that it takes a single argument, which is a pair. The first part of the pair is a list, and the second part is a list as well. Notice that both L and M are sorted lists. And what does it return? It returns a new list a single sorted list which contains the element of L and M. 
So we get, we basically merge the two lists together. We assume that L and M are already sorted, and we return a single sorted list with the result. So if we try to identify uh, the base cases, uh, if L, which is the first part of the pair, if L is empty, then we just return M. And on the other hand, vice versa, if M is empty, then we just return L. So in the recursive step, what can we do? We know that the two lists, L and M, are already sorted. That's the assumption. So if we take the hat of the former list and assign that to the name X, and the hat of the latter list and assign that to the name Y, then we can compare x and y. If, 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 if x is less than y, then we know that x should be the first or appear uh, f first ahead of y in the resulting list. So we can return x uh, merged uh, uh, and then we can return x as the hat and then the res uh, tail is the result of merging the tail of the first list, and then M un unchanged. M is unchanged because uh, X was less than Y, so X should appear ahead of Y. If, on the other hand, X is uh, greater than equal to Y, then we know that Y should appear before X, and then we return Y as the hat, and the tail should be the result of merging L unchanged, comma, the tail of the second list. So how do we implement this in, in uh, SML? Well, it's probably best to use cases and patterns because it really makes the code very readable. Uh, so what is the first case? Uh, it's a case where we have a nil list. So notice that we can use the keyword nil or we can use brackets open bracket opens, uh, bracket closes. So if the first part of the pair is nil, then there is nothing to merge m with, so we just return m. The second base case is the case where the second list of the pair is nil, and then again there is nothing to merge with, and we return the former list. If, however, uh, both L and M are lists that can be split up to head and tail. We can use this pattern here. X, double colon XT for X tail, and Y, double colon YT for Y tail. And then we just compare. If X is less than Y, then we construct a new list where X is the head of the list, and the tail is the result of merging the tail of x with the second list. Notice here, y double colon yt is the second list. Now if x is not less than y, then y is less than x, so y should appear ahead of x, and we return y double colon merge so the tail will be mer the result of merging the former list with the tail of the uh, previous list. So what we want to get back is something like this. Merge of the list 135 and 246. Notice that both of these lists are, are ordered, are sorted. We want to ba get back the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, and uh, maybe we should... Uh, trace this to get a better feeling of uh, what's happening. It's always a good idea to trace by hand. So this is our function, merge. Let me increase this. And what was our example here? Well, merge 135246. So, what happens? Um, 
the two base cases are not true. So the recursive step is the one that we're going to use. So we're using pattern matching here. So basically x is equal to 1 and x tail is equal to the list 3, 5. y is equal to 2 and the y tail is equal to the list 4, 6. Is x less, less than y? Yes, 1 is less than 2. So we built this list here basically building the list x, which x is 1, uh, as the head, and then the tail is the, list, is the result of merging the tail of the list, which is 3, 5, with the original list, oh, sorry, the second list, which is 2, 4, 6. So, we call merge again. Uh, and now, x neither of the base cases are true. x is 1 and the tail of x is the list that includes only 5. y is 2 and the tail of y is the list that contains 4 and 6. So now x is not less than y. So this is the result. y is 2 and the result the, sorry, the tail is we are merging together the list that came in, which is the list 3, 5, with the tail of the Y list, which is 4, 6. So let's take it one step further. Uh, merge of 3, 5, 4, 6. Uh, x is 1, y is 4, x is less than y, yes. So we are supposed to do this. Um, the tail becomes x, which is 3, and uh, the, sorry, the head becomes 3, and the tail is the result of merging the tail of x, which is the list 5, with the original list that came in, which is 4 and 6. So now you can see the pattern, what's happening. We basically get 1, cons 2, cons 3, cons 4, cons 5, cons 6, and cons empty. Oh, sorry, probably only cons 6 at the very end. And that's how we get the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 back. So this was our function uh, merge, the first function that we need in our um, implementation of merge sort. Now let's take the let's look at the uh, uh, function number two, which we call split. So split takes a single argument, which is uh, a list, and split splits this list into two lists. One contains the element elements one, three, and five. The other contains the element number 2, 4, and 6. And this function needs the let statement that we just previously looked at. So if we look at the base case here, if L is empty, then since split is supposed to return two lists, we just return two empty lists. If L has a single element x, then we re just return uh, a list that contains x, as the first element and then the empty list as the second element. In the recursive step, uh, we we'll let the first two elements be called A and B. And then what we do, we return the two lists A as the header in the first list and then some tail M and then B as the header in the second list and then some tail N. So, how does it look like? Our split function, if it takes nil 
as a parameter. So that's our first case. This is pattern matching once again. Then we return a pair of lists where the first pair contains nil, the, the empty list, and the second pair contains the empty list as well. The second base case is when we have a single list that um, only contains a, uh, one element. Then we return that list as the first element of our pair and then the empty list as the second element of the pair. Notice here in the example um, what we want to get back. Uh, we have a list like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 if, as an argument and we have split it up into two lists so that in the first, lit we, we, first lit list we will have elements number 1, 3 and 5 and the second list number 2, 4 and so on. So the odd elements in the first lit list and the, the even numbered elements in the second list. So we will get a pair of lists back which contain 1, 3, 5 as the first list and 2, 4 as the second list. Okay, so we covered the two base cases. Now let's look at the general case, the recursive case. So if we don't have an empty list or we don't have a, a list that contains a single element, then it means that we can break up our list using this pattern here a double colon b double colon rest meaning that we have at least two elements a and b and then some tail rest rest could be actually empty so at minimum we have a list of two elements and now comes the let statement now this is very nice we can say let val m comma n so we're bu we're building a pair pair here with the where the first element of the pair has the name m and the second element has the name n let val of m comma n be the result of splitting the rest split of rest split of rest basically split of the tail and Remember when we have a let statement, we always have a, have a, need to have an in statement as well, meaning that we have to evaluate an expression. And the expression that we are evaluating is a double colon m comma b double colon n. So our m here is the value from the let statement and our n uh, sorry the m is the the f first pair first element of the pair and the n is the second element of the pair and where do we get this pair from by recursively calling split and uh, this is something that one uh, really needs to trace to be able to visualize or to get a feeling for what's happening here. So let us actually do that. So this is our uh, function, the split function. And what example did we have a split of the list one, two, three, four, five? So what's what's happening here? Um, well, the base case uh, is not true. The, we have two base cases: when we have a nil list and when we have a list that contains only a single element. The base case is not true. That means that we can apply this pattern to the list a double colon b double colon rest so a is 1 b is 2 rest is the list 3 4 5 and then we have a let statement that says uh, m comma n will receive the value from splitting the rest in a double colon m comma b double colon n but we already know what n a is a is one and b is two 
Okay, and we know what the rest is. We split the rest, that's 3, 4, 5. Notice what I'm doing, I'm just using rewriting here. Remember, rewriting is at the heart of a functional, on the, of, of the evaluation of uh, expressions in functional programming languages. I'm just uh, swapping out the values for the given names. So, split of 3, 4, 5. So that's what we want to compute next, split of 3, 4, 5. Does the base case uh, hold? No, it's not an empty list and it's not a list of a single element. So we can apply the pattern a double colon b double colon rest. So now we have a is equal to 3, b is equal to 4, and rest is equal to the list that contains a single element 5. And now the let expression says, okay, m comma n is the result of some splitting. And let me call it m prime, so not to confuse it with the previous m and n. And this is the result of splitting the list that contains only 5 in in the pair a double colon m prime comma b double colon n prime. We already know what a is, it's 3. We already know what b is, it's 4. And we knew what rest was, that was 5. So what are we doing? We're calling split 5. Split of uh, the, the, the list that contains all the, the element 5. Uh, does uh, the first base case hold? No, it's not nil. Does the second base case hold? Yes. We have a list of a single element. And what are we supposed to re return then? We return a pair that contains the list as the first element of the pair and the empty list or nil as the second element. So I can really write this as an uh, empty list. Uh, so, notice then that the result of split 5 was this list. And that means that our m prime and n prime is that result. This is m prime n prime. Because I'm calling split 5 and I get a pair back, that means m prime and n prime. m prime is a list 5 and n prime is the empty list. So when I'm building, notice that now the recursion has ended, when I'm building the overall result, I know what m prime is. It's 5. I know what n prime is. It's empty. What is this? This is the list, the pair that contains the list 3, 5 and the list 4. Now, when I split 3, 3, 4, 5, when I called 3, 4, 5, I got this back. I got this back, which gave me this 3, 5, 4 result. That's when I did split 3, 4, 5. And split 3, 4, 5 is m, comma n. That's the value that is assigned to m and n. So m is the list 3, 5, and n is the list 4, which then means that I can compute this value. 1 double colon m, comma 2 double colon n. That will give me the value 1 cons 3, 5, and 2 cons 4. 
And what is this? This is uh, 135 as the first pair and 24 as the second pair. So this is the overall result of the function called split 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So basically what we did, we traced the recursion until we got to the base case and then we unwinded the result, basically we, we, we constructed the result uh, using uh, tracing uh, what happened during the unwinding phase. So, what have we done? We have looked at uh, the merge function, we have looked at the split function, and we have actually traced both of them. And then finally, let's write the main program, the merge, merge sort program. So it, it is a, definitely a sorting routine that we are, we are implementing. So merge sort takes a list, which is unsorted, and uh, returns a sorted version of it. So what is the base case? Uh, if L is empty, the, the list that is coming in, if it's empty, or contains one element, then L is obviously sorted, and merge sort just returns the list. If it's empty, it's sorted. If it contains a single element, it's sorted as well. If not, then we have to do the recursive step. So if L has two or more elements, then what we do, we split the lists the, the single list into two lists, M and N, and what do we use by, for that? We use the split function that we, that we have already written, and then recursively sort the two lists. And finally, we merge them by using the merge function. Notice that we recursively sort the two lists. That means that at the very end, the two lists are sorted. And then we can call the merge function, because that was our assumption in merge, merge assumed that the two functions were already sorry that the two lists were already sorted, and merge uh, uh, merged these two sorted lists and gave back a single sorted list. So this is our function merge sort. Uh, we use uh, cases and cases and patterns once again. Uh, if uh, the list that comes in is nil, we just return nil. If the list that comes in contains a single element, uh, single list, a list, sorry, that contains a single element A, we just return that list. Else, we let, we build a pair, m comma n, which is the result of splitting the original list that comes in. So we split the original list that comes in, and what do we get back? We get back a pair m comma n. That was the function of the split, the purpose of the split function. Like here, we split the function one two three four five, split the list one two three four five, and we get back two lists, a pair that contains the list one three five and two four. So, if you think about this example that we were looking at. M is equal to the list 1, 3, 5, and N is the list 2, 4. Once we have those uh, two lists, we recursively short the first pair, M, and the second pair, N, and once they have been sorted, both of them, we merge them together. So merge sort of three six five seven two should give us two three five six seven. Uh, I have this uh, program. Let me see. It's called merge sort. So I can say use and then the full path uh, and here you can see that I have three functions merge, split and merge sort 
Mertz takes a pair of lists, pair of integer lists, and returns a single integer list. Split takes a single list of some type A and uh, returns a pair of lists of the same type. And Mertz sorts takes an integer list and returns an integer list. It's interesting that uh, the interpreter uh, infers that we have an integer list, even though we haven't we haven't uh, specified any type here. That's probably because, and notice again that the merge function is the type of the merge function. Merge function is is uh, inferred, so it says that it's receives a pair of integer lists and returns an integer list. If we go back to merge, is there something here that uh, uh, are we giving, uh, are, are we specifying types here? No, but we're using the less than operator here. So remember that uh, we said that the, if we don't give any types, uh, the default type is integer, so it seems that it's using, since we're using less than, it infers that since we didn't specify the types, then we're using less than for integer types. So if x and y are integers, then it infers that we must be working with integer lists. And if merge is a function that re uh, merges two integer lists, then the result of the overall merge sort is an integer list. And then it can infer that the two, that the, the, the list that comes in is an integer list as well. So if I do merge sort of uh, three, five, eight, four, one, say, I get one three four five eight, so our merge sort works. Uh, and notice what is what is uh, uh, no, notice the expressiveness in this solution. Um, it would be very difficult for us to write uh, as compact code and as expressive code as this one in a, say, object-oriented language. You can try it to write a recursive solution for merge sort in, uh, say, C++, and try to come up with code which is as short as, as this one, and really as, uh, as expressive. We're saying here, let the value m, n, which is a pair, be the result of splitting the original list that comes in and use those two values m and n by merge sorting m and merge sorting n notice recursively and then finally merge the result together now just to conclude Let's t just look at the very first step of this algorithm. I, I, sh I suggest actually that you go through the through the whole uh, trace yourself. Uh, so take this example where we are merge sorting the list three six five seven two. Um, so what merge sort does, since we, the base cases do not hold, we don't have an empty list and we don't have a single. Uh, we don't have a uh, list that cont contains only a single element, so we have the, ba the uh, recursive step. So we compute m, n by splitting the original list. And the splitting will result in, remem remember, uh, uh, the odd number elements, 3, 5 and 2 here, as for the value m, and the even number elements 6 and 7 for the end list. And so what? once we have splitted that, we merge sort the two individual lists and then merge them together. So we merge sort 352 and merge sort 67. So how do we merge sort 352? 
Well, we split them again. So m becomes 3 and 2, that's uh, elements number 1 and 3, and n becomes 5. And what do we do there? Well, we have to merge sort them again. So we merge sort 3 and 2, and we merge sort 5. How do we merge sort 3 and 2? Well, we split them into uh, the list that contains only the element 3 and the list that contains only the element 2. And now we have we merge sort 3 and we merge sort 2 and we have the base case because merge sorting a list that contains a single element is the list itself. So merge sorting 3 will give me the list 3, merge sorting 2 will give me the list 2 and then we merge them together. Remember merge assumes that we have uh, two lists that are already sorted. Yes, we have two lists that are already sorted. They contain only a single element. So merging the lists 3 and 2 together will give us 2, 3. So the result of merge sort 3, 2 gives us the list 2, 3. The merge sort of 5 will give us the list 5 and merging those two lists which are already sorted, will give us 2, 3, 5. So the merge sorting of 3, 5, 2 actually gives us 2, 3, 5. Merge sort of 6, 7 gives us, of course, the list 6, 7. So then we have two sorted lists, 2, 3, 5 and 6, 7, and when we merge them together, we get 2, 3, 5, 6, 7.